1959, Dr. Scribner was referred a patient with severe kidney failure. He was dialyzed several times and did not have restoration of kidney function. So what could, could Dr. Scribner do? Nothing. He had to send this poor soul back home where he died of his, his kidney failure. Well, this was very depressing to Dr. Scribner. It was uh, something that kept him awake at night thinking, what could we have done that would keep him alive? One day, um, one of the surgeons at the university mentioned that surgeons sometimes would use a Teflon tube for <coughs> a graft, a vast vessel graft. Of course, Dr. Scribner jumped on that idea and arranged with a medical engineer and with Jack Cole to work out a system that would allow the Teflon tubing to be molded into the right position for the right patient. And in March of 1960, that patient arrived, Clyde Shields. He had the, the cannulas placed in his arm, molded at the bedside, by Jack Cole, and Clyde was kept in the hospital overnight as a test to see if it was going to stay open. And the next morning, it was still working. And we did our first dialysis. Dialysis was expensive, it was costing the university a lot of money, it was taking up a lot of space, it was a lot of work by our technicians. So we made, spent a lot of time making a very complicated grant request to uh, the NIH and uh, had a site visit by three prominent physicians. They went back and together they made the decision what we were doing was treatment. It wasn't research. They weren't going to give us much money. Probably the most depressing event in Dr. Scribner's research life to be denied money for saving lives. And it was their responsibility to pick out patients who would be dialyzed. And unfortunately, not everyone could be selected. There, there wasn't enough money and, and uh, availability of equipment to dialyze everyone. So uh, that was a nasty part of the uh, uh, early uh, stages of dialysis. The end stage renal disease program was financed by the federal government and has been financed ever since. And uh, no patient need go without dialysis because it would cost too much. When I was working at Virginia Mason, a lot of rewarding things, but a young woman in her 20s had ulcerative colitis and end-stage kidney disease. 
Well, she had a sister who could donate a kidney and we could dialyze her until that was possible. And that's what we did. And about three or four years ago, I was walking in the halls of Virginia Mason and someone came up from behind and said, hello, Dr. Hester. And it was that patient. She had her kidney transplant 30 years ago. She gave birth to three children afterwards and is still healthy.